So let's get started. Good morning, good, good, good afternoon, and good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Um, welcome to the COP26 side event on Fukushima 10 years, has, 10 years past Fukushima to the next stage. Um, I am Hasegawa from the Japanese Embassy in Berlin. I'm now based in Berlin, but I, before that, I live in Fukushima cities and uh, engaged in the management of contaminated waste and soil uh, caused by the nuclear power plant accident, uh, actually 10 years ago. Uh, as you all of you know, the Fukushima area was seriously damaged by the Great East Japan earthquake and following the nuclear power plant accident, and forcing many residents to evacuate. 10 years have passed since then. So little is known, unfortunately, what had happened and what will be happening in Fukushima area. In addition to uh, physical damages caused by devastating uh, disasters, uh, there, uh, Fukushima people are suffering from unscientific rumors and fading memories. So this seminar uh, is divided into uh, four parts. Can you move to the next slide? And today we have uh, a welcome, short welcome message followed by uh, uh, distinguished speakers for the keynote speech. And then we have several messages from and to Fukushima. We also have opportunities to discuss each other at the last session. By the end of this seminar, I hope you will capture the state of things happening in Fukushima area. So having said so, uh, I'd like to share a welcome message from the Japanese environmental minister. Minister Yamaguchi was appointed as the environmental minister this October. Unfortunately, uh, due to the conflict of the diet session, he cannot make it today, but we have a video message from him. So please take a, take a, look, take a look at the message. Welcome to the Japan Pavilion Seminar, Fukushima, 10 years past Fukushima to the next stage. I am Dr. Tsuyoshi Mike Yamaguchi, Japan's Minister for the Environment. Channel Zero. I'd like to say a few words on this occasion. The Great East Japan earthquake of 2011, March 11th, seriously damaged Tokyo Electric Power Company's Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant and caused enormous damage, forcing many residents in the Hamadori area of Fukushima Prefecture to evacuate. Ministry of the Environment has carried out environmental restoration projects such as decontamination on a scale and method never seen in the world before in order to return Fukushima to a land where people can live in peace. As a result of these efforts, in March 2020, all evacuation orders, except for the restricted area, were lifted. For example, divided roads and railroads were resumed, and the residents gradually returned to the cities, towns, and villages of Hamadori area. In Fukushima, as a pillar of reconstruction, the slogan is pioneer of renewable energy and future-oriented actions are taken. For example, Fukushima Hydrogen Energy Research Field was constructed, equipped with the world's largest hydrogen production facility. Related industries are gathering and related research and development have been carried out. In Fukushima, Okuma town, which seriously suffered from the earthquake and nuclear disaster, boldly took the initiative in declaring the 2050 zero carbon city. Also, Namie town, while enthusiastically working on reconstruction, is energetically advancing toward decarbonization. Namie town signed the world's first Declaration of Municipal Partnership for Hydrogen Advancement of Smart Sister Cities with Lancaster City, California on October 1st. In this seminar, I really would like to appeal to you that Fukushima is resurrecting like a phoenix, an environmentally advanced region. And I would also like you to find out where Fukushima stands now. Fukushima is being reborn as a more attractive region. The 
the Ministry of the Environment will continue with the affected areas to transform Fukushima to a new great model of renewable energy. And I hope that Fukushima will be the beacon for the world. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for that. Now come back to Glasgow. I would like to open the panel discussions by inviting a distinguished guest speaker, Professor Dr. Henike. It is my great honor to, all, to have you here today. Um, as, you, as most of you may know, Professor Henike is an internationally well-known expert in the field of energy and climate policy, as well as resource efficiency. Uh, he was the president of the Wuppertal Institute until 2008, and is a, a senior advisor to it. Uh, in addition, for over two decades, Professor Henike has been providing advice on energy transition in Japan. So ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Professor Henke. So thank you very much for this warm welcome. It's uh, really a pleasure and an honor to be here on this uh, side event on uh, the transition of our energy systems towards climate neutrality. I'm talking in my capacity as the German co-chair of the German-Japanese Energy Transition Council uh, on current status and the future challenges in a comparison between Germany and Japan. The table of content is very uh, Dense. I talk a little bit, some words on the German-Japanese Energy Transition Council, then on basic frame conditions between our countries, on the status quo, and on the long-term targets of climate mitigation in Germany and in Japan, looking into some of the latest scenarios in Japan and in Germany. So, what is the council about? Uh, 16 members, renowned scientists, are working together since five years, close to governments, but scientifically independent. We try to raise the synergies between the partnership of Germany and Japan. We produced a lot of studies, hundreds of pages. You will find them on our website, gtdc.org. And we conducted a lot of um, dialogues with stakeholders uh, and established really trustful relationship with our partners, the Institute of Energy, uh, Energy uh, of Japan, uh, which is financed by METI, and the German side is financed by the Ministry of Environment in Germany. So, the basic data on Japan and Germany, I must be very brief, the main difference is the greater part of coal and the smaller part of renewables in Japan in comparison to Germany. Uh, but when it comes, there is uh, some technical problems, you can solve it. And. Uh, much more environmental benign transportation system uh, in Japan than in Germany. The per capita commission societies in Germany and in Japan. Um, we have abundant energy, renewable energy in the south, uh, maybe more in Japan than in Germany for photovoltaics, and wind power offshore, onshore. Of course in Japan more floating because the coasts are very steep, we have shallow coasts in Germany, and uh, we have to extend the grid to 
includes more fluctuating renewable energy uh, in Japan and in Germany. Last but not least, in Germany we decided to phase out nuclear. In Japan it's still debated how to handle nuclear in the future. So when we compare the status quo and the targets of long-run climate mitigation policy, we can see that uh, uh, in Japan we have new documents, we have a new idea how to step forward to uh, carbon neutrality in 2050. In Germany we decided to step forward uh, to uh, carbon neutrality in 2045. So, uh, going a little bit back, So, some little technical problems. Let me step to uh, Germany first. Uh, as you know, we are embedded in the European Union and two huge new packages are conducted by the European Union, FIT 455, meaning a more ambitious carbon reduction target by 55 percentage for whole Europe. And the Green Deal is a new idea how we can step forward in a just transition and in a green transition to a socio-economic transformation of our societies. That means that the existing ETS system will be strengthened. That means that renewables, the share of renewables and of efficiency will be increased. And it means a faster rollout of low emission transport modes. And last but not least, measures to prevent carbon leakage uh, for European Union. So we have a lot of uh, discussions uh, and uh, challenges which we can solve together. So when it comes to Germany, uh, we had a ruling of the federal constitutional court which caused a lot of impacts on policy. They said that there must not be restrictions in the fundamental liberties of today's young generation. This is really a cornerstone of a ruling and it meant that we cannot live on the expense of the living young generation. So, uh, policy reacted and increased the ambition. in making it happen are permissible sector budgets. For example, when you look at energy, it's now uh, obligatory and a strong political self-commitment to reduce carbon dioxide within 10 years about from 280 million tons uh, to 108. And this holds true for the other sectors as well and the ministers responsible for the sectors have to put this into reality by developing implementation plans. This is due and we will see how this will work. When we look at uh, Japan, I must, I can be very brief. Uh, most of you know the sixth strategic energy plan. It raises the ambition level 
to 46, maybe 50 or even more to 2030. It raises the share of renewables uh, up to 37, maybe even a little bit more and make renewables a strong priority in the development. And some key strategies were developed, uh, for example, uh, floating wind power offshore and electrification and so on. So within the GTTC we selected four representative scenarios uh, and compared them uh, in a study which will be published until uh, the beginning of next year. For Japan we selected a study from Nice, from the Renewable Energy Institute, from IGs and of course from the IHJ, which is our partner, country, uh, partner institute. And in Germany we selected four representative perspectives, one from a consultant a think tank Agora, where Wuppertal Institute conducted to the study then from the German Energy Agency, the so-called LEED study, and what is really important from the BDI, which is the perspective of the German industry. And last not least, from the Environmental Agency, which is a very interesting experiment. I will show you the results in a second. So, what are the scenarios about? What are the main messages? I select one of those talks, Climate Neutral Germany by 2045. It develops a strategy in three steps, halving the primary energy. So there is an increase of GDP, maybe about 0.7 percentage each year. Uh, we have a very tremendous increase of photovoltaics and wind within the scenarios and an increased electricity, green electricity, maybe really even a doubling and a higher demand for green hydrogen and zinc fuels in the next decades. What does it mean in carbon dioxide uh, when you compare the post-annual reductions each year uh, 70 million uh, carbon dioxide equivalent, it, we must have a doubling, nearly a doubling for the next 10 years. That's highly ambitious, no doubt, but it's technically, and as I will show, economically feasible. It means, for example, that renewables has to be increased tremendously, that we need more water electrolysis uh, to produce hydrogen as much as possible on a national scale, but about 75% must be imported. And we have to speed up the process of retrofitting our building stock from now 1% each year to at least 1.75% each year, meaning that the rest of heat buildings, of the heat for buildings, is conducted by heat pumps or green district heating systems. This is about uh, the increase of electricity, of green electricity. You can see it's a tremendous increase, very courageous, especially based on photovoltaics, on wind power, onshore, offshore, um, and uh, an increase of net power generation by nearly fourfold. I mentioned this new scenario, which is quite important, especially for the comparison between Japan and Germany. The Environmental Agency in Germany conducted a scenario where they combined climate mitigation policies with resource protection policies. And the message coming out of this, using circular economy elements, recycling as much as possible, the message is quite clear. It makes everything easier. It closes the gap to 1.2 degree path if we combine these two policies. And I urge Japan and I urge my own government to step forward to this policy integration and uh, to get rid of silo thinking, uh, which makes it easier, more acceptable, and even more cost-effective. So what about Japan? To be very brief, we selected one very ambitious scenarios which has been conducted by Agora. 
uh, by a renewable energy institute by, by a Finnish institute uh, at the University of, uh, of uh, uh, Finland um, heading for the net zero emissions in 2050 with reasonable costs that's very important in a three-step GHG reduction road first 45 in 2030 stepping up to 90% in 2045 and then having hard to abate uh, processes in industry where we need uh, negative uh, emissions. The imports of green electricity uh, would lower the costs and this is a high, uh, really a big challenge for Netherlands to establish uh, connections to neighbor countries, maybe uh, Korea, maybe Mongolia, Russia, and maybe China. There are some plans working in that direction. Um, in that scenario, we don't need nuclear in the long run. That would be a very promising uh, uh, message uh, to all people who know that there are still risks connected with nuclear. Uh, but of course, it, it depends on assumptions and on the scenario modeling. To be very brief, uh, they have two basic scenarios. One is called the base policy scenario. Another one is delayed policy scenario. For example, delayed means two new nuclear reactors uh, extending the lifetime of nuclear and so on up to 2050. And the other one is very close to a scenario of IGs, the Institute of Global Environmental Strategies, uh, getting rid of nuclear up to 2050. And the big question is, what will that mean uh, when we compare uh, the energy consumption? We have four factors which could reduce in a Japanese scenario context the primary energy consumption by population decrease, as I mentioned. We have aging societies in both countries, then renewables, electrification as much as possible, renewables, and efficiency gains. And this is quite comparable to the methods coming out of German scenarios. This, um, <clears throat> the um, pictures for the capacity and the increase of green electricity in a base scenario with imports. Of course, this is a challenge, but one uh, message coming out of this scenario work is that imports would make it easier and cheaper for Japan on a whole. So these are the very promising figures for the total costs. At the left side, total costs for sectors. At the right side, uh, the cost components, and as you can see, within these assumptions and within these scenario modeling, the costs will even decrease by reducing carbon dioxide to zero and getting rid of nuclear in 2050. Very promising uh, messages. Of course, we have to debate uh, whether the assumptions are valid and so on. So, to come to the end, what are comparable, what are different strategies between Germany and Japan? We both step forward in electrification. Electrification maybe is the main message and energy efficiency. And let me mention not only energy efficiency, but as I presented, combining energy and material efficiency first, as the IEA has told us. Material and energy efficiency first makes it easier, makes it less costlier, and makes it more acceptable for the public to step forward. And then, uh, of course, the energy mix is uh, different. We have the phase out in Germany up to 2022, and it's still debated uh, in Japan. So last picture, some people say, uh, are the Germans over ambitious? Because for a highly industrialized country, stepping out of nuclear and coal and getting rid of carbon dioxide up to 2045 is a huge challenge, no doubt. The interesting answer to this question is all the latest six studies. 
and I added two which have been uh, published some months ago, for example, by McKinsey, for example, by Ariadne, which is um, uh, financed by the Ministry of Research, a gigantic experiment of many modeling approaches. And last not least, Deloitte, uh, they made a cost-benefit analysis for Germany. Uh, are the benefits higher than the costs? And let me, well, end with one quotation from McKinsey for Germany. They say, quote, Germany can achieve climate neutrality by 2045 at net zero costs for society as a whole the savings through climate protection up to 2045 can offset the costs of decarbonization. That's, of course, an encouraging message, and let's work together to bring our both countries in that direction. Thank you very much for your attention. Okay, thank you very much, Professor Henke, um, to share your views on the importance of energy transition. By comparing two countries, we can now get, uh, have a, a good overview of the situation, energy situation as well as the, the pathway towards the climate neutral world. So now, let us dive into the Fukushima agenda. Uh, we are going to capture the on-the-ground efforts and the challenges that Fukushima has been facing. Today we have five speakers, uh, including three video messages. The first speaker is from the national government, uh, Mr. Nunota, uh, who leads the Fukushima Regeneration Project as the Environmental Ministry. Uh, he will present the policies and activities in Fukushima. So Mr. Nunota, you have the floor. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for joining in this seminar. Uh, I'm Hiroshi Nunota, uh, Director of Office in Ministry of the Environment, and I'm in charge of the Fukushima Regeneration Future-Oriented Project, which is contributed to, toward Zero Carbon Society. Today, I'm going to talk about environmental regeneration from, uh, from damage of great disaster and future-oriented effort of reconstruction and decarbonization in Fukushima. Today's focus region is Fukushima. Uh, this is the map of Japan. So Fukushima is located to the north of Tokyo. Uh, Fukushima is a very flourish and beautiful area of nature and crops, such as peaches. And you can see the beautiful picture of the historical building of Aizu Wakamatsu Castle, located in uh, Fukushima. Regarding to the scenic beauty and fascination of Fukushima, Ms. Zoe Vincent is going to give you the guidance in the final part of this seminar. So, in my presentation, in order to introduce Fukushima's activities toward the environmentally advanced region, in spite of facing difficulty of reconstruction from disaster, I'm going to focus on three topics in this presentation. Firstly, I'd like to introduce the overview of damage of the uh, great earthquake and the accident of Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant very briefly. Uh, next is the environmental regeneration project, especially decontamination work in Fukushima. The finally, uh, Fukushima starts to rebound to the environmentally advanced area, so I'm going to talk about the future-oriented project towards zero carbon society. The uh, first topic is about the overview of damage of Great Earthquake and the nuclear accident in 2011. This slide shows the picture of damage at the time of the Great Earthquake and the Tsunami. So this is the picture of Minamisoma City located in the coastal area of Fukushima. 
March 11th, 2011, a great earthquake and tsunami devastated a northeast coastal area in Japan widely. As you can see the number of victims, about 20,000 people in Japan were died in this tremendous earthquake and tsunami. Large scale of tsunami caused an accident at Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant. Uh, because of loss of all power supply and cooling water, uh, and finally leading to damage of the core reactor. As a, uh, as a result, large amounts of radioactive substances were released into the environment. This picture shows the distribution of the air dose radiation rate, uh, so within 80 kilometers uh, of nuclear power plant uh, at April uh, 2011. As you can see, mainly northwest area of the nuclear power plant was highly contaminated, and large area was affected by radioactive materials. About 165,000 residents of Fukushima Prefecture were evacuated as of 2012. Let me move to the next topic about environmental regeneration project. So in order evacuees to return the area where they lived, reducing the radioactive dose rate is necessary and decontamination work have been indispensable task to lower this dose rate. So Ministry of, oh sorry. Sorry. Uh, so Ministry of the Environment is in charge of the implementation of decontamination work within Japanese government. So this slide shows uh, uh, decontamination activity in Fukushima. You can see workers remove the surface of the soil or peeling of the soil uh, in housing area uh, where radioactive substances had fallen. This is an effective method to lower the radioactive dose rate. Uh, washing the uh, surface of road is an effective way for decontaminating road. Uh, so as a result of decontamination, uh, large quantities of contaminated soil and waste have been generated. So interim storage facility was built to control and storage of removal soil and other materials this facility is now under free operation. Uh, this slide shows the result of decontamination. The green area and the gray area was evacuation order area. So on March 2017, a Ministry of Environment completed decontamination work in full area of special decontamination area, which is colored by green area. So this green area has been high dose rate and has been including evacuation area. So due to this achievement, evacuation orders have been lifted in nine towns and cities. So let me show you more specifically about the result of decontamination of the green area at previous slide. So air dose rate in residential area has decreased 60% after, immediately after decontamination, and 76% has been uh, reduced uh, as a result of post-decontamination or monitoring. So post-decontamination monitoring means uh, implemented after six or 12 months later of decontamination work. Uh, as of April uh, 2019, the evacuation order area has been reduced from 1,150 to 340 square kilometers, and the number of population of evacuation order area has fallen from 81,000 to 23,000. 
So in evacuation order lifted area, more than 15,000 persons have returned uh, home uh, as of uh, April uh, 2019. So let me move to final topic about future-oriented project for creating Fukushima to zero carbon society. Uh, Japan is now tackling uh, with reduction of CO2 in order to achieve the zero carbon society. On October 2020, uh, Prime Minister declared in the policy statement uh, that Japan aimed to carbon neutral and achieve a zero carbon society by 2050. Japan is target for reduction of CO2 emission uh, in this slide. Towns which located in coastal area of Fukushima made a declaration for zero carbon city Namie and Okuma Town, uh, which is located in coastal area of Fukushima, declared the zero carbon city on 2020. Uh, Naraha Town and Hirono Town also declared on 2021. Uh, this slide shows the outline of Fukushima Regeneration Future Oriented Project. Fukushima uh, has been promoting activities uh, to achieve zero carbon society. This project aims to contribute to uh, their activities, so Ministry of the Environment has also contributed to the recovery, uh, recovery in Fukushima, not only from the viewpoint of decontamination work, but also from the viewpoint of environmental measures, such as reducing carbon emission uh, or uh, environmentally recycling. We started this project on 2018, uh, which consists of four parts, uh, such as support for industry creation or support for zero carbon urban development and so on. This slide shows the example of this uh, current project of this project. So Ministry of, of the Environment carried out the feasibility study to identify the potential for introduction of renewable energy, such as fuel cell car, uh, which using the inexp inexpensive hydrogen. And we established a subsidies program a uh, program to fund for introduction uh, of the renewable energy uh, in Fukushima, uh, such as solar power. And the financial volume of these feasibility study and the subsidy program is about $4.5 million in fiscal year uh, 2021. I'd like to conclude my presentation. So 10 years have already passed since Great Earthquake, and Fukushima uh, starts to rebound environmentally advanced area. Uh, many of the evacuees can come back to the coastal area of Fukushima uh, thanks to effort of Fukushima itself and the contamination work. The, while Fukushima faces difficult, uh, difficult task of recovery, Many of cities and towns have already tackled with activities towards zero carbon society. Now Fukushima recovery enters a new stage, so Ministry of the Environment is providing support to meet the need of Fukushima from environmental perspective, including zero carbon society. So thank you very much for joining in my presentation. So next program is the video presentation, uh, presentation from governor of Fukushima and mayor of Okuma and Namie. They are going to give you very impressive message about each activity towards zero carbon society. And the final program of this seminar is that Ms. Zoe Vincent uh, is going to give you a guidance of the Fukushima's scenic beauty and fascination using a very, very beautiful slide. I hope you enjoyed this seminar until the end. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, uh, okay, thank you very much, Mr. Nenota. As he mentioned, 
Uh, now we are going to share three video messages from Fukushima uh, uh, community leaders who cannot make it today, unfortunately. Uh, all of them were uh, responsible positions at the moment of the earthquake and have been leading the community since then. The first one, the first video message is the governor of Fukushima Prefecture, Mr. Uchibori. Uh, he was the vice governor at the moment of the at, the at the time of the earthquake, and he became the governor seven years ago. So, the, can you open the video message? Good afternoon, everybody. I am Masao Uchibori, governor of Fukushima Prefecture. Thank you very much for this opportunity to speak to you under the title of From Fukushima to the World, Making it a Reality, One at a Time, Fukushima. I will be talking about the reconstruction efforts after the uh, earthquake and the nuclear accident, renewable energy, hydrogen energy, and also our efforts toward decarbonized society. Those are the things that I will be covering. Firstly, Fukushima is located about 80 minutes away by Shinkansen from Tokyo. We are blessed with beautiful nature, rich history, tradition, and culture. Many culinary delights, too. Since the Great East Japan earthquake and the nuclear accident, 10 years and eight months are passing from the UK and from in and out of Japan. We have received a lot of help and assistance. Thanks to you, Fukushima is gradually and steadily reconstructing itself. After the accident, a wide area of the prefecture was contaminated with radiation. Radioactive substances needed to be removed from the surface of the land, and other decontamination efforts were made. As a result, the air radiation dose in Fukushima is down to about the same level as major cities of the world. Right after the accident, 12% of our land was designated as the evacuation zone. But now, it is down to 2.4%. Reconstruction works are 98% complete. Railways, roads, and other infrastructure are back in operation. Our agricultural, forestry, and fishery products are thoroughly checked for radioactive contamination to ensure safety. Fukushima's produce is renowned for its quality both in and outside Japan. The current export amount has surpassed that of the pre-accident period. New technologies are going to drive Fukushima into the future. Along the coast, where the damages were particularly grave, robotics, energy, aerospace hubs are created, attracting many researchers. A new national project called Fukushima Innovation Coast Framework has started. Thus, our rebuilding efforts are bearing fruits. But at the same time, over 30,000 people are still nuclear refugees. Decommissioning is taking a long time. Malicious rumors are still rife. We have a lot of obstacles. Yet, Fukushima is determined to revive itself independent of nuclear power in a safe, secure, and sustainable manner. Renewable energy is promoted widely. Around 2040, 
more than 100% of our power demand will come from renewable energy. In 2020, our interim objective of reaching 40% was already achieved. We are seeing many positive outcomes. Conventional fossil fuel will be replaced by renewable energy sources, and we are proactively looking at hydrogen as an alternative. Hydrogen contributes to further efficient use of renewable energy as well as to GHG reduction. In March 2020, in the coastal town of Namie, using renewable energy, one of the world's largest hydrogen plant called Fukushima Hydrogen Energy Resource Field was opened. The hydrogen produced there was used to light the torch of the Tokyo 2020 Olympics and the Paralympics. This facility will lead us to the future new energy society. In recent years, many areas of the world are hit by natural disasters. A large typhoon caused damages in Fukushima. The world is facing climate crisis. Global warming is a common problem of the world. In Japan, in October 2020, 2050 carbon neutrality was announced. Following the announcement, Fukushima in February this year, to commemorate 10 years from the disaster, declared its goal of achieving a decarbonized society in 2050. For this, the entire population of the prefecture needs to be involved in taking energy-saving measures and using more renewable energy. CO2 collection and reuse need to be promoted, too. Also, people's lifestyle needs to change. Fukushima will be a sustainable and beautiful hometown for our people. We need to pass our land down to future generations. Every actor needs to be involved in tackling global warming. Lastly, I would like to share with you what our people are doing as part of their climate actions. Tadami Town is located in the western part of our prefecture. Tadami River flows into the sea of our neighbor, Niigata Prefecture. Tadami's junior high school students went to the beach of Niigata and were shocked to see so many single-use plastic bags and PET bottles, which all came from upstream. They cleaned the beach and were determined to do something more. They came up with the idea of using old newspapers to make eco-friendly bags out of them. These are the bags which are now widely used in local shops. These bags are raising the awareness of the people. In addition, the students created SDGs pins out of 
indigenous beech trees. SDGs への理解が広まることを目指して、They set the pin with a letter to the United Nations headquarters in New York. And the Secretary General Guterres replied with his autographed picture and a letter recognizing their contribution. The students are all the more determined to protect and preserve the environment. Fukushima is continuing its efforts to recover from the disaster and the accident. At the same time, we are determined to realize a safe, secure, and sustainable society. Everyone is taking part in their efforts to tackle climate change. To all the participants today, as well as people who are thinking of us in the world, I would like to take this opportunity to extend my sincere thanks. Fukushima is taking positive steps one by one. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. Interesting story. Um, comes from the mayors of towns alongside the Pacific Oceans. Can you stop the video? All right. Okay. So next, we have next uh, two videos from mayors of towns. The first one is a message uh, by Mayor Yoshida uh, of Okuma Town where the TEPCO's nuclear power plant is actually located. Uh, all of the uh, 11,000 residents in the town had to evacuate on the night of the nuclear power accident 10 years ago. And he was a town hall staff at that time and became the mayor two years ago. And also he pledged the net zero uh, town last year. So we have a video from him. 大熊町長の吉田。I am Jun Yoshida, town mayor of Okuma. I would like to extend my heartfelt thanks to, for gi giving me this opportunity to talk to you. Although it is through a video letter this time, but I hope people around the world could understand how Okuma is working hard day by day to achieve zero carbon towards post-disaster recovery and reconstruction. Thank you. Okuma town is located in, on the coast of Fukushima in the center of a district called Hamadori. About 60% of the Omura, Okuma's land area is covered in forest. The town is rich in nature. People in Okuma have been living with the bounty of mountains, rivers, and the sea. The Pre-disaster pre population was about 11,500. Although being located in the northern part of the main island, it seldom snows in winter and it is comfortable in summer. TEPCO's Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power station is located in the towns of Okuma and Futaba. Its total power generation can supply electricity to about 1.4 million households per year. Before the power plant was built, there was no significant industries, no job opportunities in Okuma. Farmers used to go elsewhere to work during winter. Fukushima Daiichi created stable employment in our hometown. On the 11th of March 2011, at 2.46 p.m., the Great East Japan, Japan earthquake happened. In Okuma, the seismic intensity was 6 plus, and the height of tsunami was around 15 meters. Right after the earthquake, power, power and water were lost in the whole town, and most residents spent the night without any information. After the earthquake, the entire town was evacuated to a neighboring city. 
Then hydrogen explosions occurred at Fukushima Daiichi. Expecting the evacuation could be a lengthy one, about 300 residents fled further inland to the Aizu region. After the accident, the, the town was forced to evacuate for a long time, but there was an area where the impact of the radioactive materials was relatively small, which was Okawara area. A new town hall, council flats, welfare and business facilities were constructed for the town to make a new start. And eight years on, on the 14th of April 2019, a new municipality building was completed and the opening ceremony was held. So far, I have been talking about Okuma town before and after the disaster. Now I would like to touch upon one of the pillars of reconstruction, uh, zero carbon approaches. On the 9th of February 2020, Okuma announced its zero carbon declaration as we all went through the pain to be forced out of our hometown. We do not want others to experience the same pain due to the climate change either. Because of this strong determination, we decided to take the initiative in tackling climate change with a challenge, which is a challenge faced by all mankind. The key principles of the declaration are three produce, circulate, and bestow. They are utilizing local resources to produce power. The locally produced power will be supplied through a new local power company to build a local system to circulate the town. This way, we will bestow sustainable Okuma to the future generation. Based on these three principles, we made the Zero Carbon Declaration. Based on the declaration, the town published the Okuma Town Zero Carbon Vision in February this year. In this vision, Okuma declares its goal to achieve zero carbon by 2040. I decided to place zero carbon as the pillar of reconstruction and recovery. It is because zero carbon could trigger further development of Okuma where people would like to live and work. For instance, houses with high insulating performance save energy more. They are warm and comfortable in winter. By installing solar panels and batteries, when a large earthquake causes large-scale power cut again, electricity can be supplied. As for the surrounding areas of Ono Station, Okuma's private distribution lines will connect the entire areas to supply local photovoltaic power. This way, we aim to build Okuma as grid independent, disaster resilient, and clean town. We will introduce mega solar and large scale wind power as our main power sources. We also introduced biomass, mini hydropower on Sakashita Dam and other unused renewable energies in our town to supply and supply power locally through the new local power company. So that people can enjoy comfortable and energy efficient lifestyle, we will promote zero carbon in houses and transport. The areas around Ono Station will be connected by private distribution lines to realize smart community. We will transform Okuma to a town of 100% renewable energy and try to attract RE100 companies. Towards achievement of this blueprint, we will implement each major one by one. To achieve one, a zero carbon vision, it is important to visualize CO2 emissions in Okuma and evaluate the performance of carbon reduction measures. In September, the town assembly established the Reconstruction Town Development Ordinance to Advance Zero Carbon in Okuma, which requires local businesses to report their energy consumption every fiscal year. Based on the reported 
data. We will conduct annual analysis and evaluation on our measures. In order to achieve zero carbon in 2040, we will enhance the effectiveness of our measures. One of the policies to achieve a zero carbon vision is to set up a new local power company to establish a system of energy which is locally produced and consumed. We concluded a partnership agreement with the main company of the new power company with funding from local financial institutions. The company was set up on the 28th of September this year, aiming to start selling electricity from the next fiscal year. Ten years ago, Okuma faced the nuclear power plant disaster, which forced the entire town to evacuate. And now, the whole world is facing a new crisis called climate change. As Okuma went through the pain to free, flee from our hometown, we do not want others to experience the same agony due to climate. With this strong determination in mind, Okuma has been making efforts. Zero carbon is already an international trend. I understand many countries are introducing advanced approaches. In comparison, Okuma's efforts have just started. Having said that, because Okuma experienced the total town evacuation 10 years ago, we have something to tell to the audience. That is why we participated today. If today's presentation could make more people interested in Okuma town and more people to work with us towards zero carbon, I would be Really happy. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Mayor. Um, the final video <coughs> is from also Mayor Yoshida from Namie Town. Um, the town is located about 10 or 20 kilometers from the Tepco power plant. And the Again, the entire population of the town had to evacuate uh, within a few days after the accident. Um, he was a chairperson of the town hall, town council at the time, and then became the mayor uh, three years ago. So please have a look. Good afternoon, everybody. I am Kazuhiro Yoshida, mayor of Namiye. In the 19th century, Glasgow was the heart of the Industrial Revolution and now a leading smart city of the world. I'm very honored to have this opportunity here in Glasgow to talk about our town, Namie. First of all, since the disaster in 20. 11, the world has extended their assisting hands to us. We suffered a total evacuation of the entire town. The population of Namie felt devastated, but now we can see the light at the end of the tunnel. I'd like to express my heartfelt gratitude toward everyone in the world who helped us. Let me share with you our experience. Namie is in the northeastern part of Japan at the eastern tip of Fukushima Prefecture. Since before Christ, hamlets were formed, cultures were nurtured, and we have Obori Soma earthenware, which dates back to the 17th century. Namie fried noodles are comfort food and other rich local resources. Before the earthquake, Namiya's population was bigger than 20,000. However, because of the Great East Japan earthquake and the nuclear accident, the entire population left and now is back to 1,700. Ten and a half years ago, on the 11th of March, Namiya was hit by an earthquake of 6 plus in intensity and a tsunami over 15 meters high. 182 lives were lost. On the next day, the nuclear accident 
prevented us from saving other lives, and we were forced to flee the disaster area. Namiya's population have overcome all these hardships, and four and a half years ago, the evacuation order was partly lifted, the fishing port reopened, a new roadside station opened, and we're seeing signs of recovery. There was a nuclear disaster which wiped our town out. And all the more because of that, we're determined to rebuild our town using renewable energy. Hence, on the 5th of March 2020, Namiya declared its commitment to become a zero carbon city. On the 7th of March, Fukushima Hydrogen Energy Research Field was opened with Namiya using abundant renewable energy sources, various types of renewable energies are generated and considered. A large-scale solar power plant is now supplying our town with more than enough electricity to cover the pre-disaster demand. Wave power generation is being researched with the help of the Ministry of the Environment. Renewable energy, local production and consumption is another project. Our public facilities are fitted with solar panels and storage batteries so that renewable energy can be used efficiently. We have suffered from many disasters. With the introduction of this system, electricity supply is now possible even in a power outage and Namiya, as a result, is more resilient. In addition, of our public fleet, electric and fuel cell vehicles are increasing year on year. We aim to achieve a zero emission public fleet and have an ambition to widen the use of zero emission mobility to the entire population of our town. Last November, we announced Namie Hydrogen Town Initiative. We aim to widely use hydrogen in our town. Right now, we are looking at economic and legal implications. As hydrogen infrastructure, hydrogen pipelines on top of electric poles, hydrogen stations enabling various types of charging and usages of hydrogen, hydrogen delivery services which delivers hydrogen together with daily necessities, world's leading hydrogen mobility, and many other possibilities are explored. We are determined to realize a hydrogen-based society. Hydrogen energy promotion and education are continuing. Nami Hydrogen Festival to promote hydrogen invited local children and gave them an opportunity to drive hydrogen-powered go-karts. Namiya's hydrogen was used to light the torch of Tokyo Olympics and Paralympics. Furthermore, the world-famous architect Kengo Kuma is helping us rebuilding our town with an efficient use of hydrogen in mind. On the 1st of October, with Lancaster in the U.S., we signed the world's first hydrogen partnership declaration. Together with Lancaster, we will try to promote the use of hydrogen at sub-national levels and expand the, expand the circle of like-minded municipalities. In conclusion, if global carbon neutrality is to be achieved, and to leave this planet to our children and their children and beyond in a healthy state, renewable energy and hydrogen energy will need to be exponentially increased and promoted. Namie, as a carbon neutral front runner, will keep challenging ourselves and achieve our goals one by one.
I would like to take this opportunity to ask for your continued assistance and cooperation. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Megan Yoshida. Uh, by the way, at the entrance of this seminar, probably you get a small gift back, and you can see a small a tableware in, in your bag, in your present bag. Uh, this is actually comes from Namie Town. Uh, we use it for chopstick, uh, to, put a, to place a chopstick on it. Uh, if you are a foreigner or, or Western, West, <coughs> if you don't use chopstick every day, maybe you can use for forks or uh, knives to place uh, on it like this. So, again, uh, now back to Glasgow again. Uh, let me invite our final speaker, uh, Miss Zoe uh, Vincent. She used to work for the Fukushima Prefecture Tourist Association in Fukushima City uh, between 2060 to 2020. Uh, needless to say, the tourist sector was heavily damaged after the tragedy. I hope she will share her views with us on her unique experiences. So Zoe-san, you have the floor. Hello everybody. Thank you for attending today's seminar. My name is Zoe Vincent. I'm very happy to be here today to speak to you about five things I learned in Fukushima as the final presenter of this seminar. Before, before I start, a little bit about me. I'm originally from the UK and I studied Japanese at the University of Edinburgh and I worked I moved to Fukushima in 2016. I spent four years in the prefecture, promoting tourism through sharing information online, attending tourism expos, guiding representatives from international media outlets, and much more. I now live in Tokyo. When I was asked to speak at this seminar, I looked back at my time in Fukushima and realized that there are some important life lessons that I've learned from living in the prefecture. So I'd like to share them here with you. So far today, we've heard about the exciting energy-related initiatives being implemented across Fukushima Prefecture. I hope my presentation will give you an overall picture of what Fukushima is like. So my first lesson is, don't believe everything you read on the internet. Search online for the word Fukushima and you'll come up with results like these. After the Great East Japan earthquake and tsunami of March 11, 2011, and the nuclear accident that followed, images like these flooded our screens. For years, this is what people thought when they heard the word Fukushima. Back in 2011, we weren't quite so accustomed to the term fake news. Especially in the months after the disaster, much scary misinformation spread online. Perhaps you remember this particular picture. It was featured on many sites as a map which showed the radiation that was spilling out of Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power station and poisoning the world's oceans. However, actually it was created by the NOAA Center for Tsunami Research to plot the maximum likely wave height of the March 11 tsunami. To make things more confusing, countless articles from international news outlets and other online blogs conflated the word Fukushima, as in Fukushima Prefecture, with the area around the nuclear power station, which was often also described as a wasteland. I want to give you a more full, a fuller picture of Fukushima Prefecture. So we've already seen some maps of Fukushima today. Fukushima is the third biggest prefecture in Japan. It's in the north, uh, north of Japan's main island and you can get there in 90 minutes by high-speed Shinkansen train from Tokyo. It's split into three main areas via mountain ranges. Not only does each area have distinct weather and scenery, but the history and the culture varies too. The grayed out section to the right of this map is the area that is still affected by the nuclear accident. And um, I, was give, I was kindly given this scarf today 
it's from Futaba town, which is one of the towns um, which was affected by the disaster on the, towards the coastal, on the coastal area of Fukushima. So ra rather than views of abandoned towns, these are some more representative photos of Fukushima Prefecture. Coming to Fukushima, the difference between reality and what was featured online helped me really understand the importance of thinking critically when I consumed information. My next lesson is, a soak in the onsen makes everything better. Perhaps you've ex experienced onsen before. Onsen basically means natural hot spring, and Fukushima has a lot of them. Onsen baths are found at hotels and traditional inns, but can often be visited even if you're not staying as an overnight guest. Some are inside, while others are exposed to the elements. Some facilities have many baths, and others let you book your own private one. You can often find public foot baths in onsen towns too. Onsen are a great place to find quiet peace of mind, a place for inner calm, a place to chat with your friends, or even get to know a few locals. I have to say that onsen are now one of my favorite things in the world. And while it's true that they can be found all over Japan, in my opinion, it's the variety of natural beauty in Fukushima that makes them even more special there. I really recommend a dip in the onsen after a day out in the freezing cold or after a hard day out hiking. My next life lesson is, it's okay to eat ramen for breakfast, and it's delicious. There are many different varieties of ramen in Fukushima, including the unusual tomato ramen, which you can see here. But the most famous is Kitakata ramen, which is even served for breakfast. Kitakata city, has as many as 120 ramen stores for its population of just 50,000 people. The tradition of serving ramen for breakfast in Kitakata comes from farmers wanting a meal from when they came home from a hard day, a long night's work in the fields. I'm personally more of a marmite on toast kind of girl, but I did enjoy ramen for breakfast when I had it. And although it's technically a soba dish, I'd like to give a honorable mention to this. This isn't ramen, it's soba, but this is, called Fukush this is called negi soba and is famous in Fukushima. Eating noodles with a green onion is definitely one of the most memorable meals I've had to date. My fourth life lesson is sakura is not just a flower. Before coming to Fukushima, I thought there was just one type of sakura, or cherry blossom. But there are so many varieties, and while cherry blossom does make for a really beautiful Instagram post, there is more to meet these, fl these flowers than meets the eye. There's... Sakura is a reminder of the impermanence of everything, and of just how vital it is that we make the most of every single moment that we have. Cherry blossom season is an opportunity to reconnect with friends and spend some well-deserved time relaxing. And for the people of Tomioka, a town located just 10 kilometers from the nuclear power station, Sakura is a symbol of hope for a brighter future. Being able to go see the Sakura in Tomioka, a town which is still partially affected by the disaster, is in itself symbolic of progress, of things moving forward. My final life lesson of today is nana korobi yaoki, which I will explain in a minute. This phrase is associated with a certain traditional craft item in Fukushima. There are a number of traditional crafts unique to Fukushima to the, in various different areas. For example, Tsuchiyu kokeshi dolls shown here, which are found in the central area, and Akabeko red cows, which are from the western area. Many of these items are associated with good luck. In fact, the akabeko is thought to ward off disease. This is another one of these lucky crafts. It's called an okiagari koboshi, 
It's a bit of a mouthful, and I just said it wrong. <laughs> it has a saying associated with it, which is Nana korobi yaoki. Can, in English, this can be translated as fall down seven times, get up eight. So this little guy, it's often in this size, has been around for 400 years and em really embodies that saying. No matter how many times you push it over, it will always get right back up to where it was. Even before the disaster, this resilient mentality was present in Fukushima. I'm always in awe of this resilience when I meet people from Fukushima, especially those who lost so much due to the disaster. People in Fukushima and Japan take inspiration from the sprays. I know it gives me motivation to get back up and keep moving no matter what, and I hope it inspires you too. Thank you very much for your time today. I hope you learned something new, and I'm looking forward to seeing some of you in Fukushima in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Zoe san. It's very unique experiences. I've never thought that I, I heard something about onsen here in Glasgow. <laughs> anyway, so uh, let, let us move to the Q&A session. Uh, we have three panelists here in Glasgow, and we also have three more online um, from Fukushima, uh, including Mayor Yoshida of Namie Town, uh, Mr. Hoshi from the Fukushima Prefecture Government, and also Mr. Tatemura from Okuma Town. So maybe, first of all, may I ask uh, Professor Henike, Henike Sensei, uh, could you share your thoughts or uh, some messages um, about uh, a specific advice for the Fukushima areas uh, who uh, they are trying to transit their energy uh, uh, component? Can you hear me? Okay. <clears throat> Let me start with one point. I mentioned this German-Japanese Energy Transition Council. And the founding time of it was two years after the Fukushima accident. I have been there, and I must tell you, I never was so frightened by a disaster than in that region. With that background, I'm really, really impressed which tremendous development happens in the region. And uh, I must say, I am admiring the courageous of the mayors, of the people, of the ministry to step forward in a zero emission society. It's absolutely amazing, it's unique in the world, and thank you so much for this good message. Thank you very much, Professor Nikki Sensei. So maybe we have a, a, a little bit of time to take a, a floor. Uh, if you have, maybe I can take one or two questions. So gentleman in the blue and a lady in the behind. We have a microphone. Can you, can you wait a moment? Yes, yes, please. So if you, can you identify yourself a bit and then yeah, so, uh, Matthew Meyer, I was just curious why it was just decided to partner with Germany. Can, can you can you speak a bit clear, clearly? Okay, Matthew Meyer, yes. I was just curious why the decision was made to partner with Germany, a country that is building new coal, new gas, that has missed all its climate targets, and that is not actually decarbonizing. When you're looking to actually decarbonize with your country, how was that decision made to go with Germany? And then, can you move to the microphone to our lady behind? Hello, everyone. My name is Shirley Rodriguez. I'm, I'm, a, I'm from Peru. Uh, my question will be for the panelists. So, at the report from the International Energy Agency, it says, I'm going to quote them here, Failing to, the t to take timely decisions on nuclear power and carbon capture storage will raise the cost of a net zero emissions pathway and add to the risk of not meeting the, goal, the goals by placing an additional burden on wind and solar to scale up even more quickly 
than um, to reach net zero emissions. So my question will be based on the claims that some of you made today. How are we trying to reach net zero knowing that the International Energy Agency says that we cannot achieve decarbonization without the help of nuclear energy? Thank you. Okay. So maybe I can ask Professor Henike and Nunota-san or our panelist over the screen from uh, Okuma town or Namie towns to make a response. Yes. yes. Mm -hmm. well, thank you for the questions. Um, I must confess it's not an easy task to get rid of coal, gas, and of nuclear. Uh, it's a challenge. And we are still uh, struggling with the challenge. But let me say three things which makes me very, um, well, confident that we will step in the right direction. The first one is we reduce carbon dioxide by 42%. Uh, this is a lot, but not enough. Um, the second is we increase the share of renewable electricity from domestic sources up to 50% due to a fit-in law and incentives and bringing the costs down for the whole world. Uh, I think that was an impressive learning process uh, which was taken up in many other countries and I hope that uh, the still relatively high cost in Japan can be reduced uh, to the international level. The cost for solar at the moment is about five to six cents per kilowatt hour. Uh, the cost of wind power in Germany is about six to seven cents per kilowatt hour, but still going down. So, that's my great promise that we will step in the direction of reducing carbon dioxide by 65% in 10 years and coming to a, a net zero society in 2045. We will need CCS and CCU for industry, uh, but not uh, in the amount which is debated in other countries. Uh, and you are right, the costs will increase and we should put our most important efforts to bring the costs down on the supply side. That means to combine it with energy efficiency and material efficiency. If we do this, we don't need carbon capture and storage uh, in Germany uh, only for some hard to debate, hard to abate uh, industry, cement industry, uh, chemistry and maybe um, steel, but uh, maybe it's better to change the process in the direction of uh, using carbon uh, hydrogen, green hydrogen, to make steel out of it. Then we don't need the CCS for steel. Um, if uh, uh, Yoshida, Yoshida Chocho or Tatemura san, if you have any comments or any any plans in your, in your towns, how to achieve the net zero plan, if you want to say something? It's okay? Oh, maybe no. It's <laughs> okay. So I will speak in Japanese. Yoshida Chocho, Moscow, Tatemura-san, Mayor Yoshida or Mr. Tatemura, if you have any comments to make, we'd welcome them. Yes, let me say a few words. Oh, net zero, to achieve it, it will be very difficult and challenging. But uh, at this seminar on Fukushima, at the end of 2019, within the prefecture, 
the uh, renewable energy accounted for 35 percent of the total demand. And in the world, that is quite a high level of introduction of renewable energy. So as to the Ministry of Environment, of course, uh, we are holding the seminar on Fukushima, uh, renewable energy introduction in Fukushima. Of course, we are going to continue with our assistance to them. Thank you very much. So before closing, do any panelists have final questions, message uh, you'd like to share with us? Zoe-san. Okay, Zoe-san, please. Hello. Can you hear me? Okay, <laughs> thank you. Um, I just wanted to say that I have been really super inspired by all of the really positive in, uh, initiatives going on on the coast. And I had a question for the for Namie Chocho, mayor of Namie town, um, about the hydrogen town um, for Namie. I was wondering, is this like the first one that's been? Is this the first in the in the world, or is, if there have, if there are other places that have achieved sim uh, hello that are aiming to achieve similar things? Um, where did they take inspiration from? Uh, Mr. Yoshida, I hope you understood this question. Could you answer the question, please? Did you hear the question? This is Yoshida, the mayor of uh, Namiya. I hope you can hear me. I'm Yoshida. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. This um, energy field is a, one of the largest um, such facilities in the world. And towards zero carbon, uh, many municipalities need to cooperate, and we are determined to achieve zero carbon. Thank you very much for that comment. So thank you very much for that. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, to wrap up the event, I'd like to invite uh, Vice Minister Shoda uh, from the Minister of the Environment for closing remarks. Thank you for joining our sad event. I'd like to make a closing remark on behalf of the Ministry of the Environment. Ten years have passed since the Great East Japan earthquake, and I think you could understand how Fukushima changed during this time from the impressive lectures of Fukushima Prefecture Governor, Mayors of Okuma and Namie, Professor Peter Henke, and Ms. Zoe Vincent. I'm sure that this is a very significant session to introduce decarbonized, decarbonized efforts of Fukushima. We will continue to actively support the introduction of renewable energy in Fukushima, steadily promote efforts aiming at environmentally advanced regions and send the new, attrac new attraction of Fukushima to the world. And uh, please visit Fukushima as an environmentally advanced region. You will surely have a wonderful experience. In conclusion, I hope this seminar will be an opportunity to encourage decarbonization efforts and lead to new partnerships. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So, ladies and gentlemen, uh, on behalf of the event organizer, I'd like to show my huge thanks to all panelists, uh, including those from Fukushima, uh, for delivering the message. And I, uh, my, appreciation, so my, my appreciation also goes to all the audience uh, for your contribution to the event. So thank you very much for that.